Hey, hey, how you doing? Welcome back. It's my dog Lola. I'd move the uh, <laughs> I'd move the screen um, so you could see her better, but then I, I can't see how well you can see me. I know I'm framed okay now, so I'm not gonna go mucking with stuff. So, but me and Lola are here, um, and we're hanging out with you uh, on, a, on a Saturday, no less, uh, finishing up the chapter lectures for chapter one, and this will in fact be the last lecture for chapter one. So hopefully we just tie together a few other things we've been talking about here. Um, and yeah, finish off chapter one and get ready to move on to the scientific method. Um, part of which is going to be it preluded here a little bit. So what we're going to focus on here is clinical psychology. Um, I haven't been talking about clinical psychology a whole lot as we've been going through. And in fact, the last lecture was squarely focused on experimental psychology and how it has developed. So now let's sort of wedge some clinical psychology in there uh, as well. So a big question, and this is a question always related to psychology. In fact, right from the birth of psychology, I, when I told you about the math and the importance of math and the psychophysicists and, and uh, forgetting functions and all of that, psychology from its birth has been trying to establish itself as a scientific discipline like biology, like chemistry, like physics. Um, and so it's really, at least on the experimental side, you know, from its early days, it was trying to be scientifically rigorous. In fact, the whole uh, rejection of introspection, largely, was because it just wasn't scientifically rigorous enough. And other psychologists felt like, ah, the other sciences won't take us seriously unless we can much more objectively measure what we're studying. And so there is always this question, well, what does make something a science? Um, and, and that's a very important question. We're going to talk about it in a lot of detail in chapter two. But it became a real, real issue uh, in the development of psychology when this guy showed up on the scene, Sigmund Freud. You're going to hear about Sigmund Freud um, later uh, in, in, in quite a bit of detail. And in fact, those of you taking Psych AO2, he'll be a big part of the clinical part there. Um, but in the history of psychology, let me just introduce him this way. Um, Sigmund Freud was trained as a medical doctor, uh, and he really much took a medical doctor's a kind of approach to what he did. And there is this notion of the medical model. And if we think of a medical kind of situation, if you go into a doctor and you say, hey, I have these symptoms, I have a scratchy throat and and I don't know, maybe my, my tummy's been upset lately and every now and then I, I feel like I'm really warm, maybe there's a fever. So a doctor will listen to the symptoms and they will try to figure out what the underlying cause is. And so the, the logic in their mind is you probably have a virus or, or you, there's some underlying cause that's producing all these symptoms. So the symptoms are just a reflection of the real problem. And if we want to get rid of the symptoms, the right way to do it is to figure out what the cause is and to deal with the root cause, not so much with the symptoms themselves. And so Freud, what made Freud really interesting is he was one of the first that started to believe that in addition to sort of um, physical illness, there was what we might now call mental illness, that, that um, the psyche, the, the mind of the person was very complex. And Freud thought there are times when we could have certain experiences in our lives that muck things up you know, cause problems, um, leave what, what he would call psychic tensions or psychic issues, and that these would show through as symptoms. Uh, and, and so people would have trouble in life. They would have trouble with relationships, maybe. Um, they would have trouble with happiness, you know, depression kinds of things. They would have trouble fitting into society with others. Um, and, you know, they would just be at times really unhappy. And Freud came up with this therapy, this approach to try to help them. And because he thought it was all um, based on things happening in their mind, he, he also started to create this, this theory as he talked to people. Um, he created what, what was his understanding of what gave rise to things. So he created something we now call psychoanalytic theory. 
and you know a lot about it. Uh, the idea that a lot of the, that the root causes of our issues are unconscious and they're unconscious intentionally because there's something keeping them from our conscious mind. Our conscious mind isn't able to, to deal with it. So let me, let me just give you a, uh, a, a prototypical Freudian story. Uh, and so you can sort of have a sense of, of how some of these thoughts might be. One of the things uh, that interested Freud early on were seemingly medical conditions people had, but ones that didn't have a medical cause. So we might imagine somebody who, th this is the reality of the story, let's say. Um, they were going to work, um, forgot something, um, had to go back home at, at an unusual time. And when they got home at that unusual time, there was some weird sounds they were hearing from, from the sort of bedroom area, from their bedroom area. And so this dude goes over there and um, starts slowly opening the door. And okay, so now let's say in reality, his wife is having an affair. Um, and he starts to get a glimpse of that. He starts to maybe get an understanding of what's going on. But then something really crazy happens. He suddenly goes completely blind. Um, closes the door, goes staggering out, falls over furniture. And, um, you know, you can imagine that the wife and whoever else is in there are probably scrambling around. Dude might be taken off. Goodness knows. Um, but this guy comes to the hospital and he says, you know, I don't know what, I'm suddenly blind. And Freud would check him out, have him checked out physiologically and say, well, there's nothing wrong with his eyes. There's nothing wrong with his visual system. It all looks fine. He is what we'd call hysterically blind that it seems to be a, 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 some sort of mental thing that's preventing him from seeing stuff. Now, Freud would understand that whole situation in the following way. He might say that for this guy, maybe his wife and his family are everything, you know, and, and the idea of that blowing up, um, suddenly not having a wife, not having a home that, that he knows, not whatever, is just psychologically too much for him to even contemplate. And so... The brain did a, a sneaky thing. The brain struck him blind immediately and blocked the information. So it's like he might have been getting some information about what was going on there, but it blocked that from his conscious mind and suppressed it, prevented him from being aware of what he was seeing and what was going on. Why would it do that? Well, because it allows him to continue on his life, right? It allows him to behave as though this thing that he cannot psychologically deal with as though it didn't happen. Um, and so, so Freud would say, you know, childhood sexual abuse, all sorts of things like that. Our mind has these protection devices, these defense mechanisms, and they prevent certain things from entering consciousness. Okay, so I just gave you a little bit of that taste of that story, but here's what I really want you to understand. That's a story, okay? It's not based on data. It's not based on experimentation. Well, it's sort of based on data, I guess you could say. It was Freud talking to people and trying to understand how they got to the situation they were in and making a whole bunch of inferences. So for example, that dude I'm talking about, that dude would probably never say, oh, they were actually, oh, I understand now, they were actually having an affair. That dude doesn't want to understand that, doesn't want to get there. And so therapy is really difficult because the purpose of therapy would be helping the person to get there, to have what's called catharsis, um, to come to the realization, oh, that's what happened and that's why I haven't felt, that's why I've been messed up since, you know, to some extent. But all of the theory Freud came up with was just his story to explain what he had seen. And a lot of scientists are like, that's not how you come up with a theory. You don't just listen to people for a while and then say, here it is, here's my whole theory. And Freud's theory is very complex, very specific, had all these components that interacted. It's fascinating. So the other thing to realize is Freud was a very um, interesting writer, a really good writer. Um, he wrote about his ideas in fascinating ways. And then a third point that's really critical, Freud talked about sex and sensuality during the Victorian kind of era um, in Europe, an era where people didn't talk openly about sex or sexuality. That was all kept very hush-hush. But Freud didn't just talk about the power of sexuality. 
he talked about things like young children being sexually interested, like a young boy being sexually interested in his mother, young girls being sexually interested in their father. Like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? But he would talk about all of this within this scientific framework that he described. And so people were fascinated by Freud. I'll, I'll mention one other thing about Freud. He wrote a few stories about the, the benefits of cocaine. He was a big cocaine fan at the time. A lot of people were experimenting with cocaine at that time. Freud thought it made you very productive um, and, and thought it was a really kind of good drug. Uh, and so Freud was out there with the public. They read his work because he was fascinating and he was talking about sexual issues and he's kind of on the edge. And he really got a lot of public interest to the point where the public started to think, this is what psychology is. That shocked and horrified the experimentalists because they're saying that's not what psychology is, some story about why people have problems or issues. No, no, we've been trying to scientifically understand the human and how it works for a long time. And they felt like Freud had just kind of hijacked all of that. You know, the careful methodology, the behaviorist kind of approach to, you know, not talking about things you couldn't study. Freud was just completely, and he was because he wasn't a scientist, right? He was not a scientist. He didn't want to be a scientist. He was approaching things the way a doctor does. But he became the face of psychology. Uh, and so that really um, was an issue at the time for a lot of the experimental psychologists. There are a lot of places, and U of T is one example, where if you look at the history of University of Toronto, the first psychology program is at, is at UTSC. And look at the date here. Friday, June 20th, 2020 is the first PhD grad. So you can imagine four or five years before that, 2015, was when the program started at U of T very recently. There was no clinical psychology here. We had all the other kinds of psychology, but not clinical. Why? Because U of T prided itself as a scientific institution. We give you a Bachelor of Science for your psychology degree. And for many decades, um, clinical psychology was not deemed scientific. Uh, and therefore, it was not part of what we taught at U of T. That's changed, and that's why this has changed. Um, clinical psychology has learned along the way that, you know, you can't just say my therapy is good because people tell me they feel better. And that's, that's how it was for many years. Rather, you actually have to collect some data. You actually have to confirm the efficacy of what you're doing. You have to use research and data to improve your methods and your techniques. So, uh, clinical psychology started to embrace this decades ago, um, started to also have an experimental side. And that has, in fact, flourished to the point where now, you know, trying to understand uh, mental disorders and mental health in general is a core part of psychology and core part of experimental psychology. So it's now been sort of embraced. Um, but for a long time, it was seen as the problem, <laughs> the, the kind of, you know, not real science and, and therefore a problem that so many people believed in. It. Okay, kind of cool. So what does make something a science then? Well, you know, really... These are the general sense, and, and this is the core notion here. So where do we want to start? Um, I don't know. Um, it's, you can start almost anywhere here, but let's say we start here. So we develop some theory about something that we think is true. Well, what do we do? Well, we first look out into the world and say, is this even a sensical theory? Does it look like my theory might be right? And let's say when we look in, in nature, we think it, it might be. Right. Um, and so then we think some interesting questions. Well, why is this happening the way it's happening? And if I start to think of the why, this is much more functional, right? What's going on here and why is it going on? And if we do that enough, we might be able to come up with a prediction. Well, if it happens for the reasons I think it happens, then there might be certain situations where it really happens and maybe others where it doesn't happen at all. You know, if I understand the cause of that thing, then I should be able to look at situations where that cause is present or absent. And I should be able to predict when my phenomenon will occur or not. So I formulate a hypothesis that will lead to what we call test, testable predictions. You know, I can say, okay, I haven't looked yet. I haven't done the experiment yet, but I predict when I do this experiment, this is what my theory says should happen. It's really good if you have some other theory that says something else should happen. 
then you can say, okay, now let's look and we'll see which theory wins, right? So that's how you tell the difference between theories. But the core thing in science is what experimentation um, and is the notion of generating testable predictions and then testing them, using experiments to test your theory. And that's what Freud was not doing. That's what clinical psychologists were not doing. They sort of stopped here, <laughs> Um, or sort of here, maybe. Um, but they didn't go into this process of actually evaluating their theory, gathering the data to test the predictions, and then using that data to refine, alter, expand, or reject hypotheses. So this is the part, you know, that really, or, you know, down here, this will be a big part of chapter two, and we're going to talk about this a lot in chapter two. This notion of formula, you know, using a theory to formulate a hypothesis that generates testable predictions, then testing those predictions and using the data to, sh to shape your next steps and doing that continually and refining and refining and refining. Okay, that's what makes something a science. And that's what was not present in early clinical psychology, but is so now. Okay, so now there are th clear theories that make testable predictions that we test. Um, which is very cool. Okay, um, excellent. So that's it for my uh, co clinical psychology thing. And in fact, that's it for chapter one. There's a few more people in your neighborhood. I kind of split out the, some of the clinical folks. So since we just talked about clinical, you can meet some of those clinical folks next. Okay, good. I hope you enjoyed chapter one and the lectures. I will see you in chapter two. Okay, bye-bye.